Well, good evening. Happy Sabbath. Um, and welcome to the study. We're going to continue reading through A.T. Jones' 1893 General Conference Bulletin. And um, the last couple of weeks, it's been a bit, um, I don't know how to put it. I mean, Jones is is being Jones. So he's not as clear sometimes as he can be. He's trying to be a bit edgy. And so he sometimes overstates his case. But we get the gist of what, what he's trying to say. And um, so uh, before we begin reading, let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful, Lord, for the Sabbath, for the precious hours in which we can have fellowship with you and with one another. When you pour out a special blessing that we receive this double portion. Um, and uh, we just ask, Lord, that uh, as we continue to study these things on righteousness by faith, that we will have a greater appreciation of our need of you and of the steps that we need to take in our lives to be closer to you. We know, Lord, that this is not just a a message of salvation directly related to righteousness by faith, but it is also a prophetic message that Jones is addressing both of these things and help us to understand them and to put them into practice in our lives. Be with each person who is studying, who's watching these videos. May they be encouraged and strengthened. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. <clears throat> So here he's talking about the Laodicean message and, and that God provides his riches for our poverty. Now he's, he goes on, why, brethren, let us bear this in mind to start with and never try to forget it, because the further you go, the more you will see it as a fact that when we get hold of the gospel of Jesus Christ, just as it is, we find at every turn and every phase of it, the mystery of God. At every point and in every turn, you find a place and a situation in which nothing can explain it but God, and all you can do is believe that God is there. It is so, and you know the fact, and let him go ahead and explain it. It will take eternity to do that. What he wants you and me to do is to be glad that we have eternity before us in which for him to explain it to us. I'm going to be glad that I have eternity to live in, not bother about whether I understand this, that, or the other. No. God forbid that we should throw away eternal life because we cannot understand all that God understands. But ah, there is the same spirit again that Satan had to be equal with God and not submit to any, uh, to any unless we can understand all. Let that mind be put away and let us believe the Lord and let him take his own good time to explain it. Now, of course, um, this goes back to what Jones had said earlier about how we cannot understand uh, God, but that God can, through revelation, reveal himself to us as we're able to bear. But man often tries to understand God. He tries and he judges God based upon his understanding of God, which, of course, that's why we need the mind of Christ. Well, then, is your heart yielded to him? Now, that thought I had a moment ago, many say, I have surrendered to the Lord all I know. That is not enough. What you want to do is to surrender to him all you know and all you do not know. Because when I surrender to him only what I know, there are a good many things left that I do not know. A good many situations where I will meet myself and a good many things will come up and I will meet something that will be very attractive and desirable to me. And if I have not surrendered all, what then? There will be a contest, whether I surrender that or not. So I'm kept constantly in hot water to know whether I am surrendered to the Lord or not. The Lord wants you to get out of the hot water and stay out. 
Surrender everything you know and everything you do not know. Let everything go to him with no reservation now or evermore. Then you are not afraid of anything. You do not care if you drop into the bottom of the sea the next minute. It is all surrendered. You are in his hands, and then you have got something. That man has got something. He has something never had he has something he never had before, and he has something that he cannot get until he just does just that thing. So as here in quotations, the affections fixed upon him. Are your affections fixed there so that he takes precedence of everything, so that he is first before everything? Nothing at all coming into the account anywhere at any time. Is that so? When a man does that, he has got something. He has indeed, and he knows it. Well, says one, is not a man to care for his wife and children? Why? They are all surrendered to the Lord too. And cannot the Lord care for them a great deal better than you can without being surrendered to him? They are surrendered too. And instead of the situation being this, that when my affections are fixed upon him, they are severed from those who are dear to me. It is the other way. When my affections are fixed upon him, they are intensified and deepened and glorified upon those who are tenderly connected with me. Why people miss it all when they think that to fix the affections on God is going to separate them from somebody they like while on the earth. It is the only way they can love properly those whom they think they like on the earth. Of course, this is an important point. This reminds me of something. Um, It reminds me of someone who was in this movement at one time. And um, what they said at a Vespers that I was not, I was kind of worried when I heard them say this. Uh, But he was talking about how, you know, if somebody broke into his house, he would have no problem killing the person to protect his family. Um, He seemed to be quite proud of that fact. Now, what would be the problem with that in the context of what Jones is talking about? Is that person surrendered to God who believes that he would have no problem killing somebody who broke into his house and threatened his family? I would have to say no. No. So why? Can you give the reasons why? In this situation, in the Ten Commandments, we are told, thou shalt not kill. Now, Mm -hmm. our situation here, if someone was to break in, while this would not be premeditated, Mm -hmm. It would be something that while we would look to defend ourselves and those that we love, mm-hmm. I don't see that we are to do that by karma, by causing harm to another party. Mm-hmm. And, and we can see that we're not completely surrendered to God in the sense that the things that we don't know, but what are going to happen to us that we have no control over. Well, um, I got a right. comment for that. What's that? I got a comment to that. Okay. And the comment is, is what about Abraham chasing down those guys that stole Lot and all his family and stuff? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously there's killing in the Bible. Right. right. So, so people will look at those examples and they say, well, you know, we should go to war. What, what would be the difference then and now? Do we live in a different time? Yes, we do live in a different time. Okay. And and I'm not talking about a different time in the context of the gospel. Because we know, because Jones has already showed us, that, that the world has us. That it has the power over us. 
And the only way that we can overcome the world is through the power of God. So we aren't in a situation that Abraham was in. We're in a different situation. We're at the end of the world. And, and we're going to have all kinds of things happen to us that we don't want to control or that, that we can't control. We would like to control, but we can't control. And so people can get worked up. I mean, that's the whole thing about uh, the preppers, right? You know, I'm going to have the food. I'm going to have the ammunition. But in the end, he that takes up the sword will perish by the sword. Correct? That's what it says. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we if we have this belief that somehow... God isn't going to protect us. But you 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 have Jesus as an example. He went to the cross. Mm -hmm. And he didn't kill nobody when he went there. Yeah, and, and the disciples as well. Yeah. They recognized that the state had a power over them. That that there was things that they couldn't control, but they could control. They, they couldn't really have their freedom taken away from them or their life taken away from them. You know, I, it, it's a difficult thing because, you know, there is a part of our nature that would want to fight for our life and for the lives of those around us. And we could look at it in a sense as noble, but in the context of the gospel, I don't see it as noble. So you don't you didn't see the uh, martyrs during the uh, persecutions uh, where they were burning these people like going to door to door pulling them out and then uh, killing these people up killing these people uh, you, you didn't see them going kicking and screaming you know they kind of knew what was going on already they because they had been told you know from the word. Mm -hmm. Follow me. These are the things that are going to happen. Yeah. So we need to accept that things are going to happen to us that we can't control. But that God has overseen all those things and that everything that comes to us comes through his hand. I suppose it's just about how we meet those circumstances. Yeah. And there's lots of things that happen to us that we don't like. I mean... You know, things break down, people die, things get stolen. Um, all kinds of things happen to us that we can't control. But our kingdom is not of this world. So to be able to surrender these things, I mean, it takes faith. And things happen to us every day that we don't like, you know, like, my son selling the guitar store definitely didn't like it changes a lot of my plans, but definitely God was in that. Right. Even though it's, it's, a, it's definitely a trial for me dealing with that situation. <clears throat> but if we're surrendered to God, we can bear trials, but if we're not surrendered to God, we cannot, we can't rejoice in trials if we're not surrendered to God, because the trial is something that comes is something that we don't know about. Now, often when people say, though, I surrender all I know, um, I mean, they mean it in a different sense than Jones is talking about. Um, but but Jones does still have a point there. So, well, now, is it so? Is the will submitted to him? Is your heart yielded to God so that your affections are fixed upon him? Is it done so that you can stand before him and thank the Lord that it is so? I do not mean stand up in the congregation and say that it is so, but just tell it over to the Lord that it is so. People will get up in the congregation and say things there that they will not say to the Lord. You tell it to the Lord. Tell him that your will is given up bodily to him. Submit the whole thing without a particle of reservation now or evermore, and just tell him that your heart is yielded up to him. 
for it is good for nothing, and you want his heart instead of yours. And after that, your affections are fixed upon him, and that there they stay, and they will stay there. Tell him that all the time, every day. Tell him wherever you go. Live with him, brethren. Live with him. Live with him. That is what he wants. Why he is raised from the dead and we are raised up with him that we may live with him. Romans 6, 8. His personal presence is to be with us. That is what the Laodicean message is to do for us. It brings the presence of Christ to live in us. This you can do alone for yourself, and nobody can do it for you. Brethren, let us go to doing that. Let us get into that place. When a man is there, then he simply waits the direction of the Lord, waits the time of the Lord. When the Lord gets ready to pour out his Holy Spirit, there is nothing to hinder. If there be something that he does not know, oh well, that is surrendered long ago. It may be as dear as the right eye. But that went long ago. It is gone, thank the Lord. And so there is nothing between you and him, and he can pour out his spirit whenever he pleases. That is where he wants you and me to stand in this conference, waiting for him to give us that teaching of righteousness, according to righteousness. Now, how much of Christ are we to have when the personal presence of Christ comes to us? He will be closer to us than if he would come in here to meeting with us every day. Is that so? Congregation, yes, sir. Well, then, that is the gospel, is it not? That is the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Romans 1.17. Oh, no, from faith to works. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to works. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> the presence of Christ, the personal presence of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the gospel, isn't it? Now see here, and there is not any need of there being a particle of misunderstanding about this question of faith and works or a particle of hesitation about it. See here, Christ was in the world once, wasn't he? Congregation, yes. He did not do anything of himself. Of mine own self, I can do nothing. The Father dwelt in him. He did the works. The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. John 14, 10. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. As God was in Christ, Christ is to be in us. Is that so? Congregation, yes. Is Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever? Congregation, says yes how did he act when he was on earth in our flesh that he had how did he act in that when he was here before he went about doing good he cared for the sick sympathized with them he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows bears our sicknesses he's his sympathy with the sick was so close that he when he went to minister to them he actually entered into their feelings he actually bore their sicknesses. How will he act when he is in our flesh now? The voice says, he will act the same way. How will he act when he is in your flesh, when he is in the flesh, in the flesh now? The voice, as he acted then. Don't you see then how that the works take care of themselves in him who has faith in Jesus Christ? I do not mean that satanic belief. I mean that the man that has faith. Then don't you see what those people miss who get their minds on works more than on Christ? They miss the very incentive and the very power that alone can do the things that are good to reach the minister to the sick in the right spirit, to reach and minister to the sick in the right spirit, to visit the poor and minister to them in the right spirit. Have not you seen people who have ministered to the poor and the sick in a way that makes those people feel worse than if they had not gone there at all? I definitely have. So <laughs> that is not the kind of ministry that Jesus Christ does. That is not the kind of ministry he does. No, sir, it is Christ in you. And when he goes with you and in you, there stands the testimony. It will win even 
from worldlings the statement, they are like Jesus. Now, what we don't want to do with Jones is, uh, because some people misquote him on this point, that somehow just works are automatic, like we just focus on our relationship with Christ and ignore uh, what we see in ourselves that isn't Christ-like. Now, definitely, we're not looking for works in ourselves. That is, we don't decide that we are now Christians because we see ourselves as good. Because if we're looking for our, in, at ourselves to see our own righteousness, what will we generally see? Will we not see ourselves as righteous? If we look at ourselves, we can fool ourselves. But if we look to Christ, what will we see? The closer we come to Christ, the more sinful we appear in our own eyes. Right. right. We can never. Yeah. So we never diminish the idea of works that we that what we are going to see in ourselves is not good works. That is, we're going to, because we're looking to Christ, and we'll see our deficiencies. But we don't want to believe that Christ is just going to leave us in our sin. And so Jones isn't arguing for that. He's just saying that if you're trying to make yourself good, if you're just focused upon works, you could convince yourself that you're righteous. But if you depend upon Christ, your job is not to see works in yourself. You have to trust that Christ is going to work out your salvation from sin that he has begun in you. You have to believe that that's possible. But it comes by faith, not by works. What does he want the world to see in us, congregation Christ? He wants the world to see in our lives Jesus Christ, the life of Christ, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and they will know it, and you will know it. Be sure that Christ is there. Now, when he says you will know it, Again, you, you could misunderstand him. Because how do you know it? How do you know that you're in Christ? We looked at, at uh, 1 John. How do we know we're in Christ? Is it because we see ourselves so wonderfully? That we see all of our good works? Is that how we know we're in Christ? I would say that. So we know by faith, right? That's now, now, Christ knew that he was perfect, right? He knew that he was sinless because how did, how did he know that? Did he see himself as sinless? I don't think so. No, he didn't. He knew he was sinless because of faith. Right? It was his faith in what his father said about him and about the prophecies about him that he knew he was, he was righteous. He knew he was without sin. But he didn't know that by sight. He didn't look to himself for righteousness. He looked to his father. And his father said, this is my beloved son, in him I am well pleased. And Christ took the words of his father and believed them. He trusted that God's view of him was correct. Because he knew he had a sinful human nature. And with his sin sinful human nature, he would, he would feel the guilt and the shame of sin, even without participating in sin. Right? So this is one of the points that, that's made by uh, Wagner in the book, um, the two books on Galatians. So when Ra Wagner responds to Butler, because Butler argues that, well, Christ saw himself as a sinner. He had, you know, sin upon him when he was on the cross, but he never had that experience his whole lifetime, right? Because he's holy, undefi undefiled, separate from sinners. 
So he must have seen that he was righteous. And, and so it's only at the cross that he becomes our sin bearer. But Wagner argues if he can be our sin bearer at one time without ever sinning, then that means he would, if he's ever our sin bearer, because he's a sin bearer at another time, did he then sin? Right? So when he bore our sins, he didn't just do that at the cross. At the cross, he was now treated as a sinner by God, but he had to bore, bear our sins his entire life. And he did that by taking upon himself our nature. He was born of a woman, born under the law, under the condemnation of the law. This is the main point that both Jones, Jones and Wagner um, emphasized. Now, often people will say that 1888 was about the law in Galatians. Was it the moral law, the ceremonial law? And that wasn't really the issue. I mean, sure, it was the issue on the surface, but the issue was really what does it mean that Christ took upon himself human nature, that he was born under the law? What does it mean to be under the law for Christ? And their whole understanding of righteousness by faith uh, pivoted on this one point that Christ lived righteousness by faith. He is our example of righteousness by faith, not righteousness by sight, not righteousness by pre-existing knowledge. His understanding of who he was, what his mission was, came from his relationship with God alone, that he had as a man, Okay, so be sure that Christ is there and the spirit of the Lord will convey to people's minds that he is there. But as certainly as you and I appear instead of Christ, that is all that will appear and the world will see only that. So as Christians, we have to reveal Christ. Not that we have become Christ. Christ has live, is living out his life in us. It's not us who they see, it's Christ's, the Christ that they see. Now, brethren, is there any real need of anybody getting any misunderstanding of ha having any hitch at all about whether righteousness by faith, justify fa justification by faith, carries with it in itself the very living virtue of God to work in God's way? Is there any need of it? No, not the least. And it will never be done by any mind that is submissive to God. It will not be done by the mind that is yielded to God and wanting to have God's way. Christ first and last and through all and in all and over all. Because then he becomes so acquainted with Christ that he knows that faith in Jesus Christ brings that divine presence and that divine power and that divine virtue, and that divine grace that will so make him who receive it, so move upon him that he who has, has the most faith will be the one of all the world that will do the most work. Why you cannot separate it. The divine life is in it. The divine power is in it. The divine word is in it. Did not Paul strive, says one, and does not the Savior say, strive to enter in at the straight gate? Yes, he does. And Paul tells us how. Let us turn and read that. It is right upon this very line. And then we will quit for tonight. It is in the first chapter of Colossians, the 25th verse and onward. The gospel whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Now that, that verse has a lot of things in it. So we know he's going to focus here upon this mystery that's being made known and what that means. So Jones goes on. What is it that God wants to make known at this time to you and me? 
He wants to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery. That is a great deal, is it not? How great are the riches of the glory of the mystery of God? How great? As God is great. Then how can we know them except by the mind of Christ, which is brought to us by the Holy Spirit bringing his presence? Now then. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, whereunto I am all, I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now, how can I strive when I have nothing to strive with? Without me, he can do how much? Congregation, nothing. Is that so? Congregation, yes. Then without Christ, I want to know how you are going to strive. Without him, um, how are you going to strive? I want you to think of that. Without me, he can do nothing. Dead in trespasses and sins. Is that so? How can a dead man strive? When we were without strength, Romans 5 verse 6. We were without strength. Congregation, yes, that is so. Then how can a man strive who has no strength? Don't you see then that it is an utter satanic perversion of the divine idea to go striving and working and wearing the life out in order to get Christ to obtain this gift of justification? No, it is the free gift of God to every man. And every man who receives it, receives Jesus Christ himself indeed. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth. And he who surrenders all, yields all, and obtains that power of God, that living Savior, to whom is given all power in heaven and earth, he has something to strive with. He has strength that he can put to a good purpose. He has power with which he can do something. Then where does the, the striving come in? To find the Lord or to use the power which the Lord gives, which he puts into us, which is it, voice, to use the power? Assuredly. Then do not let us get it on the wrong side, brethren. Let us have it on the right side. Striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily, as he says in another place, the love of Christ constraineth us. That is in 2 Corinthians 5.14, where it constrains, impels, drives on with an irresistible force. That is the idea that is in the word striving. Other translations give it agonize to enter into the straight gate. And they do really and bodily agonize and wear themselves out doing penance, just like any other Catholic. And they will do it all in order to move the Lord so that he will have pity on them. That is, that is not the thought. Now, um, just there is a verse um, that uh, is important. So one of the things here um, that I mentioned before was regarding, and I can't remember if it is, I think it was in this study about uh, Parminder, but I think it might've been in morning studies. But Parminder was teaching about the nature of man and that people who were following Parminder uh, had the idea that they were perfect. Now, this is, this is you know, 2018, uh, me talking to people who were following Parminder. And I, I thought the problem was with them. I mean, I, I just thought you, you, you don't understand. Um, one guy was quite certain that he was perfect. The other one didn't quite say it that way, but he was really hinting at it, saying that Parminder studies in 2017 had totally changed his life. And um, when I tried to talk to him about it, I couldn't really get a straight answer, but it seemed to me that he was implying the same idea that somehow he had got this key to this freedom from sin. And, and I've run into this type of thing before. Now, 
let's let's discuss a uh, a verse. Uh, this is from Hebrews 12, verse 4. So we're going to look at this, even though this, because we need to look at the context of this verse. So we just take this one verse. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So what is Paul talking about here? Is he contradicting what Jones is saying? I would say no. Okay. Now, part of it is we just need to look to the verses before this. So if we start at Hebrews 12, verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the same, the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now, he's going to go all about this discipline that God has. But if we look at what he's talking about here, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the example now, when he says you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, what is the problem here? What is, why does he say this? It, it, it seems out of context for him to say this all of a sudden. Because he wants us to consider Christ. So how would we take this verse? What does he mean by it? Because people can take this verse and say, you know, we, we need to struggle against sin, and, and that's not wrong. But they will take that and say what Jones is saying is error, because Jones is on the surface, if somebody's reading it, they could pick up that Jones might be saying, we just need faith and, and the works take care of themselves, because people read him that way. But of course, they don't know what faith is, and they don't understand what works are. They don't listen to what else he is saying they read the bible the same way some people say. yeah well i know right they i mean we have all read the bible that way yeah no, I, I have in the past yeah. <laughs> yeah so if you have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin what's the context that he's giving here If you can look at those verses, can somebody explain the context here, what this means? Can we just overcome sin by striving against sin? No. 
No, okay. So what is he putting here before that? Is he not giving oh, us yeah. Christ example? Yeah, he's yeah, yeah, he's talking about what Christ endured for us. I mean, only Christ could shed his blood to save us from sin. We're not Christ. Shedding yeah. our blood and torturing ourselves isn't going to save us or anybody else. Yeah. So we have not been Christ. We need Christ to gain this victory for us. But if you just take this sentence out of its context, because we, we need to consider him that endured such, such contradiction of sinners against himself. He says, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I mean, we do need to be strengthened by what Christ has done for us. So is this not resisting and striving against sin in the power of Christ? Is this not Christ in us, the hope of glory? Is he not the author and finisher of our faith? That he has endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him? Is he also not at the right hand of God? Only in this context can we consider this, this verse. We yoke up with Christ. He promises to do something in us, but yet he requires us to cooperate with him. But it is a cooperation with God. We're not left on our own to strive against sin. We're not left on our own because we could not resist unto blood without Christ first walking that way with us, walking that path for us, and being with us the entire time. Because we can resist unto blood striving against sin only because we are holding Christ's hand, only because he is in us. There, and, and Jones is quite clear that there is a struggle, right? Always. Always. I die daily. It, it's a struggle to die daily. So, you know, people will pick up verses like this out of context and, and make them say something that they're not. So, um, so he says, translations give it as agonized to enter into the straight gate. And they do really in bodily agonize and wear themselves out. So the, all these Catholics will do all these works. Now he says, it is agonizing, but everybody who is acquainted with it knows that the word is taken from the Greek games, the Greek races. One who entered the games was agonistes. Agonistes. I'm terrible at pronouncing Greek. Anyway, they started out to run a race. Now, what does he do? He just strains every nerve to win the race. Every faculty of his being is devoted to the object before him, isn't it? Congregation, yes, sir. Now, that is bodily exercise. That is bodily striving, agonizing. Is this that kind that Christ is talking about? Congregation, no. What kind is this? Spiritual. Yes, of course. Then carrying that thought from bodily exercise, that bodily straining of every nerve, carrying that into the spiritual realm, what does it signify? Doesn't it signify that complete surrender of the will to Christ, that surrender of the heart and the affections to him that makes no reserve? And there is no reservation. It yields everything to him. Every fiber of the being is devoted to the one object. And the glory of God is not that so. Then his power moving us, his divine power urging us on, don't you see? I say again that in all cases, he who believes in Jesus Christ most fully will work for him. So we can see we have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Right? That fits in this context of what Jones has just said. Now let us have this word, and that will be the best close I could make to the whole thing tonight. Steps to Christ page 79. The heart that rests most fully upon Christ will be the most earnest and active 
in labor for him. Amen. Do not forget that now. Do not think that man who says that he rests wholly upon Jesus Christ is either physical, a physical or a spiritual loafer. If he shows this loafing in his life, he is not resting on Christ at all, but on his own self. No, sir, the heart that rests more, most fully upon Christ will be most earnest and active in labor for him. That is what real faith is. That is faith that will bring you to the outpouring of the latter rain. That is faith that will bring to you and me the teaching of righteousness according to righteousness, the living presence of Jesus Christ. To prepare us for the loud cry and the carrying of the third angel's message in the only way in which it can be carried from this conference. <clears throat> so now we're going to continue here. Third angel's message number 14. And the thoughts are going to flow in this one from what we've just seen. He's going to give us a bit of a recap, which he likes to do. We have seen the manifestation of the natural mind, the carnal mind, in two of its ways. Paganism and papacy. That's the two desolating powers, right? So you can see that Jones understands, at least at this time, uh, the two desolating powers. And that they're really one and the same. They just have a different manifestation. He says, though, but there is another one that is modern. There's one that has arisen nowadays. Another trick that the author of the carnal mind is playing and by which he will deceive lots of people if they have not got the, not the mind that is in Christ. Now, whose mind is the carnal mind? Congregation Satan's. And what is the thing that the carnal mind does mind? Congregation self. In Satan, it is self. In us, it is self. We have seen how that in paganism, open, bold, naked paganism, it put that in the place of God, equal with God in the immortality of the soul. And then we have found how that when Christianity came into the world, the same carnal mind got up a counterfeit of that and covered itself, the same carnal mind, with a form of Christianity and called it justification by faith. When it was all justification by works, the same carnal mind, that is the papacy, the mystery of iniquity. Now, there is another development in Satan's working in the last days. Separate from paganism, as it was in itself, and separate from the papacy, as it was in itself, and as it has been manifested so far, is that so, congregation? Yes. In what form does that come? In what form does Satan work in the last days, congregation? Spiritualism. Yes. And this will exalt self. But will, will spiritualism always work in the name of Satan? Congregation, no. The nearer we come to the second coming of the Savior, the more fully spiritualism will be professing Christ. Who is it that comes before the Savior comes? Many of them? Congregation, false Christ. There will be many coming and saying, I am Christ. And at last, Satan himself comes as Satan. Congregation, no, as Christ. He comes as Christ. He is, he is received as Christ. Then, So then the people of God must be so well acquainted with the Savior that no profession of the name of Christ will be received or accepted where it is not the actual genuine thing. But when false Christianity is presenting itself to the world, when every kind of false Christ appears, then how alone can a person be safe? How shall a man know that these are false? Only by him who is the tr true, only by having his mind itself. Now, if we think about Parminder, what, did Par what was really Parminder teaching? Was he teaching spiritualism? as a form of spiritualism okay so when he said you know all it means to be christ-like is to be nice and anybody could be nice it's easy to be nice wasn't he just giving his own version of do what thou wilt yeah so clear that yeah so 
And you can see when somebody is, is believing that they're without sin, that, that they're not sinning anymore. Um, aren't they captivated by spiritualism? Isn't it just the reason they don't see themselves as sinning is that their actions? See, what's that? Yeah, they don't see the need to repent. No, right. no sense of repentance anymore. They can't because it's out yeah. of the equation. Yeah, because what is their standard of righteousness? Just, you know, human nature, be nice. <laughs> yeah, your carnal nature. Your carnal nature. Carnal nature. So... Yeah, so right. this is what Parminder really was teaching. But he taught it in a very subtle way. And he deceived many people. Because those people did not have the mind of Christ. They just had the carnal mind. So spiritualism appeals to our carnal mind. Paganism appeals to our carnal mind. Catholicism appeals to our carnal mind. Now, the world right now is caught up in spiritualism. Is that an easy thing and an accurate thing to, to see and observe? Isn't that all we see around us right now is spiritualism? In music, in movies, in what they teach in school, what we see on the news? And it even makes a profession of Christianity in many cases, of some types of spirituality. And we see it all through the Protestant world as well. <clears throat> People doing their own thing. Um, I used to have a, a guy working for, at the store for me. This is about uh, 14 years ago now. It doesn't seem that long ago, but it was. And... Um, he was a Christian. He went to the City Life Church here in Leduc. And I don't know if City Life Church would be something that we would want to go to. But uh, the City Life Church, lots of rock music. Uh, and, and Daniel's asking about what Parminder taught on the human nature of Christ. He actually tried to avoid it, but I can answer that question. Uh, but I'll just go here. Um, so one of the things he noted, so he was a sort of a Christian working for me, going to this Christian church, the City Life Church. Um, but one of the things that was going on in that church is that basically, well, he wasn't married, for one, to the woman he was living with and left her after their second job. Um, but lots of people were just having relationships with whoever. It was all these young people just sleeping around. And of course, they're listening to rock music. I mean, in church, uh, you know, this, this isn't just like some mild stuff. This is pretty heavy, loud rock music. And, and of course, the messages that they're being given are all just about, you know, follow your heart, these types of things. I mean, isn't that just spiritualism? Now, the question here was, what was Parminder teaching about the nature of Christ? So Parminder didn't want to touch on the nature of Christ. He was teaching about the, create, the nature of man. And it, and it was a rather confusing idea that he was presenting. I don't know if I want to go into the details of it, but the basic idea was really um, setting us up for the idea that Jesus didn't really take upon himself fallen human nature. He only took upon himself a sinful body. And so Parminder worked hard at separating the spirit from the body. Now, do we have the mind of the flesh? Is there such a thing as the mind of the flesh? Right? Paul tells you what the mind of the flesh is. It's the fleshly mind. Carnal, carnal. Yes, the carnal mind. It's, it's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, that is when the flesh is in control. That's the mind of the flesh. 
right? Because it's only a mind that control your flesh doesn't really control you. It's the mind of the flesh that controls you. Right? Because you, you, you make your choices. That's the mind of the flesh. And it minds the things of the flesh. But the mind of Christ is not the mind of the flesh. Now, Christ took upon the flesh. Now, did Christ have a fleshly mind? That is, did he have the mind of the flesh wanting to take over his body? Did Christ mind the things of the flesh? When the fleshly mind came up and tried to assert its will, did Christ listen to that mind? We would have to say no, right? Correct. But he still had that, that flesh, right? He still had that will because he could never have said, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Right? So, the, so Parminter tried to get rid of that whole idea. He didn't want to, Christ to have a sinful human nature. He only wanted him to have a fallen body. So he tried to separate, separate out this body as something that Christ could have. But of course, not be sinless or not be sinful. He would be sinless, even though he had this body. And so it was it was a rather confusing idea. And this came out in the baptismal vows where Parminder was not willing to put in that Christ had a fallen human nature. He just put that he had a sinful body. You, you can go back and look at those baptismal vows if you have them, any of you. <clears throat> so, so we can see spiritualism in Parminder and what he was teaching, but it's all around us. And people followed him because his message appealed to the carnal mind. So we know that the truth goes contrary to our nature and that there is a struggle. Right. That nature wants to control us. And so we need the mind of Christ. <clears throat> now, I want to read to you an expression. So this is Jones again of this last phase of the carnal mind. We have read the other two. We have read the pagan and the papal. Now, when we read this last, then you will have all three of the stages we will have before us the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And then there will be no shadow of an excuse for any one of us after that, taking any position but that which is openly and itself alone, the mind of Christ, Jesus Christ, and the righteousness of God according to his own idea of righteousness. Will there? No excuse. When we see before us the direct expression of the false way in all three of its forms, then even though we be not able to understand or see the other, we will know that well enough to let it alone and take the other, whether we see it or not. Would we not rather let the devil go that we see and accept the Lord that we cannot see as we would like to? Which would you rather? I would rather take the Lord with my eyes shut than the devil with my eyes open. This is the monthly publication. I will tell you what it is presently, but I will read a passage or two from it first. This is the discipline for the week, a course of training for each day of the week. Let Thursday be your day for declaring your faith. Let's see what the faith is. Say, I do believe that God is now working with me and through me and by me and for me. Say it with a sure certainty, for it is true. On Friday, be courageous and strong and powerful. Overcome all obstacles by your word. Say, I can do all things through Christ, Christ that strengtheneth me. Say this with all the strength of your being. And I tell you that you can do just whatever you want to do, even to the working of miracles. Now, that is a lie. And that is 
that you all may see that it is a lie, I read Wednesday's discipline. On Wednesday, use the affirmations, not only the affirmations of science, but affirm all good things in yourself. Voice from the congregation. That proves it is a lie. Don't they say God is working in me and by me and for me and through me when we have come to Jesus and have his righteousness and his goodness? Then can't we affirm that we are good? Congregation, no. What is the reason? Congregation, it is in Christ. It is not in us. You are willing to admit then that when you have found Jesus and all the wealth and the honor and the power of the riches that there is in him, that even then we cannot boast that we are good? Are we willing to admit that? Are you? Voice, yes, sir. Are you? Voice, yes, sir. All right. That is not near all. I read more. Now, you can see what I was talking about with this uh, person in our movement who said that he didn't sin, right? So he had this type of spirit, this type of idea, totally blind to his own sin. Affirm all good things in yourself. Praise yourself that you are so kind and loving, that you are so honest in your intentions of serving the good. Praise yourself that you are so steadfast in these same intentions. Praise yourself because you are so strong and healthy. Yes, praise yourself because you live up so live up so strictly to the health reform so that you have good health. You have done it. Praise yourself for it. Praise yourself because you have such a sweet chari charitable disposition. You can do that, can't you? Congregation, no. Not when your, your sins are forgiven and you are free from all these things by the power of Christ. Can't you praise yourself then for your sweet chari charitable disposition that you have got such a good one? Congregation, no, sir. But I read more. Praise yourself because you see only the good in everybody and everything in all the world. Praise yourself for every good thing that you do see in yourself and for every good thing that you want to see in yourself. You must praise for the good characteristic that is there to strengthen it and praise for the good trait that seems lacking to compel it to appear. For you know that the fruit of your lips will be created for you. Now, that is what is called Christian science. And you can read the title, holding up the book. A brother handed me a copy of that thing the other day. The title is Christian Science. And on the cover is a quotation of scripture. My word shall not pass away. Now, brethren, is it not about time that we begin to believe the scriptures and the testimonies? Isn't it about time we had the mind of Jesus Christ? Congregation, amen. The mind that will confess that this, confess that this from the testimony is so, that has bothered so many of the brethren every time it has been read, now let us read it again and see whether you will say it is so, whether you believe it or not. It is time. Testimony number 31, page 44. Are you in Christ? Not if you do not acknowledge yourselves erring, helpless, condemned sinners. You are not in Christ unless you acknowledge yourself to be that. Now, is that so? Congregation says yes. Are you willing to stick to that now, whether you understand how it is so or not? Congregation, yes. Will you stick to it in the face of paganism, the papacy, and spiritualism in all their phases? Then I want to know why in the world it is not time for you and me to have a mind that will not say amen to any such stuff as that which I read from the anti-Christian science thing. I read on again from the testimony. Are you in Christ, not if you do not acknowledge yourself, erring yourselves, erring helpless condemned sinners, not if you are exalting and glorifying self? Then although these folks quote the words of Christ, it is all counterfeit. You know that volume four tells us that when Satan himself comes with the gracious words that the Savior uttered, he will talk them with much the same tone and will pass it off on those who have not the mind of Christ. Brethren, there is no salvation for us. There's no safety for us. There's no remedy for us at all, but to have the mind of Christ. And it goes through all our works, too. It is not simply for the minister. It is for everyone. Don't you remember the other day 
uh, in the talk that Dr. Keller gave us on the medical missionary work, how he saw and had seen for a long time the lack in the systems of medicine to reach and make easy the mind. Don't you remember that he told us that he realized this lack in all medical practice? He had found in their practice all the way through that there was a defect in the medical systems and that there was nothing that would, re that would reach and relieve the mind and turn it off from the diseased souls, that the body might go ahead and get well by the treatment that the physicians would give it. Brethren, has not Christ supplied just that lack that is in all the medical systems, in his own medical system that he has given us by his own spirit? The mind of Christ for the nurse, for the physician, to carry to the distressed and the diseased and the suffering, and the perishing, and get the mind of the sufferer upon Jesus Christ and have his mind taking it away from self. Then the patient being at rest, the physician can go ahead and doctor the body and it will get well while the patient is enjoying the blessings in peace of Jesus Christ and the mind which he gives. Don't you see how it goes through all your work? And it is the one thing everywhere. This part is not new to the doctor either. But as he was telling us about the defect in the medical systems, I want you to see that the mind of Christ will supply the defect. Now, this reminds me, of course, I was at Silver Hills for a couple of years. And Phil Brewer, who ran the medical side of things there, um, in dealing with patients, most of his work was dealing with the mind. I mean, sure, they changed the people's diets, they taught them how to cook properly, and, and people had quick results, especially heart patients, being on a diet that had no added fats whatsoever. Um, they would have, have their arteries cleared out in, in a few weeks. People who are popping nitroglycerin pills when they came there in a few weeks, they had low blood pressure, like, like normal, um, no longer high blood pressure. And, and no angina pain um, by following a very strict diet. But mostly what he was doing was dealing with the minds. And, and often we had people who were cancer patients and people who had um, the medical system had given up on saying, go home and die. And they would come as patients. Now, often they still would die, but they didn't die a lost person. Right. So we can see that the medical system can treat the body, but it needs to treat the mind. And the gospel, remember, um, medical missionary work is the right hand of the gospel. These two go together. It opens the doors through which the body can pass. And you cannot do health work without presenting the gospel to people. Anyway. Jones goes on, I read on from the testimony. You are not in Christ if you are exalting and glorifying self. Now, Mark, if there is any good in you, it is wholly attributable to the mercy of a compassionate Savior. Now, Mark this, your birth, your reputation, your wealth, your talents, your virtues, your piety, your philanthropy, or anything else in you or connected with you will not form a bond of union between your soul and Christ. Now, is that so? Congregation says, yes. Elder Underwood says, please read that over again. Your birth, your reputation, your wealth, your talents, your virtues, your piety, your philanthropy, or anything else in you or connected with you, even your good works, which he puts in square quotes, will not form a bond of union between your soul and Christ. Your connection with the church, Elamite goes on, the manner in which your brethren regard you will be of no avail unless you believe in Christ. Now mark this emphasis. It is not enough to believe about him, and Jones says the word about is italicized, but you must believe in him, in him. What does that mean? You must rely wholly upon his saving grace. That is Christianity. That is the mind of Christ. There is no devilism about that at all. And it can't get in there either. 
While you find it also in Steps to Christ, not stated exactly as that, I will read a passage or two from Steps to Christ beginning on page 67 and reading page 71. The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. Perfect obedience to the law of God. Perfect righteousness. And if you and I have not that, we will never have eternal life. We can't have it now or at any other time. If you and I have not perfect obedience to the law of God from the first breath we ever drew until this one now tonight, and it must be until the last one we ever draw, then eternal life does not belong to us. But just as certainly as you and I have perfect obedience to the law of God, then eternal life is ours that very moment. But that perfect obedience must read, I say, from the first breath we ever drew until this one, now, tonight, and it must be until the last one we ever do draw, even though it be 10,000 years from now, in the depths of eternity. I'm not asking whether you understand this, brethren. Believe it, and you will understand it. Well, doesn't this contradict something he has been preaching before? It does not contradict what I've been preaching. It is what I have preached all the time, and what every other man preaches who preaches the gospel. The condition of eternal life is now just what it always has been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents, perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. That is so. Then how in the world are we ever going to have eternal life? Congregation through Christ. Ah, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. But we have got to have perfect righteousness before we can have that gift, don't you see? Oh, then, just like the Lord, he comes and says, here in Christ is perfect righteousness. Here is perfect obedience to the law of God from birth to the grave. You take that. And that will fully meet the condition on which alone anyone can have eternal life. All right. Are you not glad of it? Congregation, yes. I'm so glad of it that I don't know what else to do than to be glad. Oh, he wants me to have eternal life. I haven't a thing to merit it. I haven't a thing that will meet the condition upon which alone it can be granted. Everything that I have would ruin the universe if he should grant me eternal life upon it. Well, he can't do that, but he wants me to have eternal life. He wants me to have it so bad that he died that I might have it. Congregation, amen. And oh, then again, I say, it is just like God, who is love as he is. He comes and says, here in Christ is perfect obedience from the first breath you ever drew until the last one. And you take him and his righteousness and then you have got the other. That is the condition. Good, good. Yes, sir. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God, but Christ has made a way of escape for us. Thank the Lord. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations, temp temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us, and now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. What a trade. What a trade. Brethren, isn't it awful that men will so hesitate and linger and dally before they will surrender up everything and make that blessed trade? Isn't it awful? If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then, sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. <clears throat> Christ's character stands in the place of your character, and you are accepted before God, just as if you had not sinned. Yes, sir, you and I, when we have done that, you and I stand before God, just as though we had never committed a sin in this world, just as though we had been angels all the time. Brethren, God is good. He is good. Oh, our Savior is a wonderful Savior. Congregation, amen. Brethren, that is so. Let us have let us 
let him have his own way. Now, I'm going to stop there, mostly because we've taken a lot of things in. And uh, I know it's not necessarily the best place to stop, but it's where I'm going to stop. Um, we, we have deceived ourselves. I mean, all of us. Because we often think of ourselves as better than we ought to. We compare ourselves with others, just as the Pharisee did. And when we compare ourselves with others and we see ourselves as better than others, are we justified? Do we go down to our house justified? No, we just pat ourselves on the back, you know. <laughs> It's yeah. not justified. It's not justification at all. Right. And, and you can see that that's spiritualism. I mean, it's paganism and Catholicism as well in some ways. Right. But we deceive ourselves. And all of us have done it. We look at someone else and we see their problems and we say, well, you know, I don't have those problems. Of course, we have our own problems that we've turned a blind eye to that we've hid, that we think nobody knows about. But Christ is going to change us, right? He's going to transform us. And, and I'm just going to read this little bit here, but this is will lead into when we come back to this next Friday. More than this, could there be any more? Could there be any more, think ye? Why the Lord says, more than this, Christ changes the heart. He abides in your heart by faith. That is the blessedness of it. What good would eternal life do me with such a heart? No, he does not stop at that. He changes the heart. You are to maintain the connection with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. That is the thought we had last night is the same lesson right along. So we'll come back to this next Friday. Um, I hope that for people here and people watching us, that this is somewhat of a revelation to us, even if we've known it before. That we need to remind ourselves of this message of Jones and Wagner, the message of righteousness by faith it's sometimes we set it aside we forget about it and we do compare ourselves with others and we we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to that the work of the gospel is not sometimes not doing the work in our lives that it should so i hope it's a revelation of christ to you to read these things to read them anew, to see them in a deeper sense than we saw them before. But this is the only thing that is going to help us. You know, God is leading us prophetically to the upper room. But could we go to the upper room comparing ourselves with others, thinking that we're better than the others? You know, if we go to the studies, you know, on Sabbath morning and we're thinking, oh, that brother, he said this and, and he's wrong about that. And, you know, I don't like his attitude or whatever. Aren't we worse than them? Not that it's about us and them, but you understand what I'm seeing? Mm -hmm. saying? Yeah, we, we really need to ha understand what the mind of Christ is. And we don't have it. If we come to a study thinking about how we're better than other people, we don't have the mind of Christ. So, you know, I hope people, in, as we continue over however long God's going to have us go through this process, because I believe on Sabbath mornings when we go to the studies at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, with either the Canadian or the American group, 
what we are doing is going to the upper room. We're going there with the mind of Christ, with humility, considering others better than ourselves. And only then can God use us. Because if we go to the upper room with the mind, well, I'm okay. I'm better than other people. Would there be any good in us going there? So it's definitely something that we need to pray about and we need to consider. So let's, unless there's some comments here, um, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful for the message that's come from Brother Joan's lips. Um, this evening. We're thankful for the messages that were given that Ellen White has endorsed as coming from you as being the beginning of the outpouring of the latter rain, as being the message, the third angel's message of righteousness by faith. And we know, Lord, that we have no strength in us. We are weak that we have a carnal mind, but you offer to us your strength and the mind of Christ. And we surrender our hearts to you and we ask that you can use us according to thy will. Help us to surrender all, all that we know and all that we don't know. We are in your hands, Lord, and we ask that you can help us to stay there we can make this decision day by day that you can remind us of our need of you and that you will continue to offer these things to us in spite of us. We ask for your help and we pray for each person and we pray these things and ask them in Jesus name. Amen.